Good afternoon, everyone. Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Father of light, from whom all good gifts come, send your spirit into our lives with the power of a mighty wind, and by the flame of your wisdom, open the horizons of our minds. Listen our tongues to sing your praise in words beyond the power of speech. For without your spirit, we can never raise our voices in words of peace, or announce the truth that Jesus is Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Mary, Mother of Mercy. Pray for us. Our Lady of the Holy Rosary. Pray for us. Saint Joseph. Pray for us. Saints Francisco and Jacinta. Pray for us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to thank uh, my friends, the Franciscans of the Immaculata, for inviting me to spend this time with you and for putting on this conference. It is great to be with you as we celebrate the 100th anniversary of Our Lady of Fatima on this uh, Feast of Our Lady of the Rosary. And uh, I also want to thank uh, whoever it was who uh, designed and put together the promotional brochures and posters because they used a photograph of me that was taken in August of 1997. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it kind of looked like I had found the fountain of youth, <laughs> but now you see me as, my, as I am, right? This is what 25 years on the road will do for you. Okay, let me uh, preface what I'm going to say with a little theological review. Mm, as you know, I'm sure, the apparitions of our Blessed Mother at Fatima, Portugal in 1917, theologically fall under the category of private revelation. Now remember, private revelations have no bearing on Catholic theology. They in no way form any of what we call the deposit of our faith. We hold to be God's definitive revelation to humanity. No one is bound in conscience to believe in them. We say that God's official, formal, public revelation to humanity is ended with the death of the last apostle, the apostle St. John. Hmm? But history makes it very clear that God gives us events of supernatural origin called private revelations to serve as reminders, warnings, wake-up calls, if you will. Now, when the church approves a private revelation like Fatima, uh, Lourdes, Nock, Guadalupe, and the like, uh, the church is saying that such an event is of, quote, probable authenticity, worthy of belief, Probable authenticity, that is as far as the church will go in approving a private revelation. Uh, so no one has to give religious assent of faith to a private revelation. But if a private revelation is approved by the church, it makes absolutely no good sense to ignore it, and it is truly foolish to deny it. So private revelations that are approved by the church do three primary things for us. First, they serve as reminders of what God has already revealed to us. Second, they reinforce the message of the gospel in the sacred scriptures. And third, most importantly, they should move us and inspire us, spur us on to action to put faith and prayer into action here and now. As God, in this way, makes known to us what he wants and expects of us, at different crisis points in history. Private revelations are a great, great gift from Almighty God. Now, having said that, as I begin this talk, let me go to the scriptures for a moment and quote you a few key passages. Uh, remember that sacred scripture presents us with different pictures of God, but never an inconsistent one. Now, the first one is from the book of the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 7, verse 28. God says this to the prophet Jeremiah. Say to the Israelites, this is the nation which does not listen to the voice of the Lord, its God, or take correction. Faithfulness has disappeared. 
The word itself is banished from their speech. And what were the consequences of this infidelity on the part of the Israelites, the people of God? The Old Testament tells us in no uncertain terms they were calamity, war, disaster, military defeat, pain, suffering, misery, and death. Now, let's look at the second book of Chronicles, Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. God says this, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear them from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. So what does God tell his people to do if they want healing, if they want peace? Four things. Number one, humble themselves. Have the virtue of humility. Second, pray. Third, seek his face. That is, be conformed to his wisdom and will. And finally, Turn from their wicked ways. Repent. If they do those things, then there will be forgiveness, healing, and renewal. This, my brothers and sisters, is the message of Fatima in a nutshell. Through our Blessed Mother, God is telling us what he has always told us. This is what he wants and expects from us, and it can be done. It begins with humility. And who is the most humble of all God's creatures? Mary. What is the great prayer of the humble? It is the Holy Rosary. What does Our Lady tell us to do every time she appears on earth? Pray the Rosary. There is only one thing Our Lady repeated to the three children at Fatima every time she appeared to them on the 13th of every month she appeared. Pray the rosary. Pray the rosary. Hmm? Now, you've got to understand this. The Fatima message is not a message of destruction. That is not what God wants for us. That is precisely what God wants to avert. Yes, God possesses all the power. He possesses a destructive power as well. But that's not the kind of power that God wants to show to us. The power that God wants to show to us is the power of love, the power of mercy, and the power of grace, God's grace working in us and through us. This is why he sent Our Lady in 1917. The Fatim message is essentially a message of hope, mercy, repentance, conversion, and ultimately peace. The choice is ours. All right? There's one thing God will never take away from us, and that is our free will. He leaves the choice to us. Now, also in the book of the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 29, verse 11, God says this, I know well the plans I have in mind for you, plans for your welfare, not for woe, plans to give you a future full of hope. When you call me, when you go to pray to me, I will listen to you. When you look for me, you will find me. Yes, when you seek me with all your heart, you will find me with you, says the Lord, and I will change your lot. God says, I will change your lot. It can be done, and God can and will do it, or at least mitigate whatever form of chastisement may come upon the world. If only we cooperate with the graces that God wants to give to us. If only we answer Our Lady's requests. The key point. God did not send Our Lady to Fatima to ask the impossible of us. It is not too late. It's never too late. We can't believe that it is. Mother Teresa, St. Teresa of Calcutta used to say, people ask me, what will convert America and save the world? My answer, she said, is prayer. St. Therese of Lisieux, the little flower, used to say, my whole strength lies in prayer. Prayer is an invincible weapon. Prayer moves hearts far better than words ever can. She said, I know it by experience. The power of prayer. Now, Pope Benedict, in his commentary on Fatima, if you've ever read it, you know that 
he related part of the third secret to the assassination attempt on Pope St. John Paul II on May the 13th, 1981. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you'll recall also that uh, Pope John Paul had always attributed uh, his escape from assassination on that day to the intercession of Our Lady of Fatima. John Paul said that it was Our Lady's hand that deflected the bullet that would have killed him otherwise. Pope mm -hmm. well, Benedict wrote this, that here a mother's hand had deflected the fateful bullet only shows once more that there is no immutable destiny, that faith and prayer are forces that can influence history, and that in the end, prayer is more powerful than bullets, faith more powerful than armies, end quote. Mm -hmm. We say that again for you. Prayer is more powerful than bullets, and faith more powerful than armies. So that is to say, future events are not set in stone, you see. Future events can still be altered by the prayers and sacrifices of God's holy people. That's a great part of the message of Fatima. Now, Pope St. John Paul II, in one of his visits to the United States, said this, quote, we are now standing in the face of the greatest historical confrontation humanity has ever experienced. I do not think the wide circle of the American society or the wide circle of the Christian community realize this fully. We are now facing the final confrontation between the church and the anti-church, between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between Christ and the anti-Christ. This confrontation lies within the plans of divine providence. We must prepare ourselves to suffer great trials before long. With your and my prayers, it is possible to mitigate the coming tribulation, but it is no longer possible to avert it, because only thus can the church be effectively renewed. How many times has the renewal of the church sprung from the shedding of blood? This time, too, it will not be otherwise. We must be strong and prepared and trust in Christ and in his Holy Mother and be very, very assiduous in praying the Holy Rosary." End quote. Now, for all these years, I've been traveling around preaching about the spiritual battle of our time. And it seems to me that the spiritual battle of our time is very quickly becoming the spiritual massacre of our time. Hmm? And the casualties in this battle will be lost forever. And, you know, we're at war. Intense spiritual combat. The past century has been a century of intense warfare, spiritual and otherwise. And you know that if you're going to win at war, you've got to have the right kind of weapons, right? Well, I always tell people, I'm a priest, but I own an assault weapon. Right? All this talk, of course, about assault weapons comes up in the news after, after every insane mass shooting. Hmm? There seems to be no end to them. It seems like our country has become the haunt of demons in that regard, right? But I'll tell you what, remember this. There's only one assault weapon you will ever need, and here it is. It is the Holy Rosary, the weapon to assault the gates of hell, the invincible weapon that comes to us directly from heaven through the hands of our Blessed Mother. Padre Pio, St. Pio Piacciocini, used to call the rosary his weapon. He called it the shield against Satan. Mm -hmm. And the rosary retains all of its power, even now, especially now. Let me tell you a true story. This is something that has happened uh, recently, recently in Catholic news circles. Um, bishop Oliver Dasha Doma of Nigeria is the bishop of that part of northeastern Nigeria where thousands of Christians have been attacked and butchered for their faith by the brutal, savage terrorist group called Boko Haram. Bishop Doma has seen six 
thousand members of his flock murdered, hundreds of young Christian women kidnapped and sold into slavery. Ten years ago, there were 125,000 Catholics in his diocese. Today, there are less than 60,000. The vast majority have had to flee their homes and flee for their lives. But one night, Bishop Doma was praying in a Eucharistic Adoration Chapel when he had a vision. The Lord Jesus Christ appeared to him. And our Lord said nothing at first. But then our Lord held out his nail-pierced hands. He extended his hands to the bishop, and in our Lord's hands there was a sword, a large, fearsome-looking sword. Bishop Dasha Doma took the sword from our Lord's hands, and our Lord said to the bishop, Boko Haram is gone. Boko Haram is gone. And as our Lord disappeared from Bishop Doma's sight, the sword he had placed in his hands turned into the Holy Rosary. Hmm? Well, after that, Bishop Doma organized a nationwide rosary crusade. Now today, just two years later, Boko Haram has been driven from that country. And about half of the Catholic girls who had been kidnapped, they've already gotten back. Mm? Praise God. But there's still a lot to pray for there. All right? Now remember that just a few years ago, people in that part of Africa were starting to think this Boko Haram was invincible. The decisive factor was the Holy Rosary and the intercession of the Mother of God. What I'm saying to you folks is it can be done. All right? It is being done. Nothing is impossible with God working through the intercession of his holy mother. you got to believe that, right? Can you imagine what could be accomplished? Now, we are told that there are now 68 million Catholics in the United States. Could you imagine what could be accomplished if 68 million Catholics would pray, pray together, stand together, Stand as one, stand in solidarity with our bishops? Can you imagine a rosary crusade with millions of Catholics praying, answering Our Lady's request? Could you imagine if the bishops would only organize a rosary crusade like the one Bishop Doma did in Nigeria? This country could be transformed. Our parishes could be transformed. Our homes, our families could be transformed because that's where the power is, right? Pope Pius XII compared the rosary to the slingshot of David, the slingshot he used to slay the giant Goliath. In his encyclical letter, Ingrensium Malorum, he wrote this, quote, it is not with physical force, not with arms, not with human power, but with the divine help obtained through the rosary that the church and all its members, strong and undaunted like David with his sling, will be able to confront the infernal enemy. End quote. You see, my brothers and sisters, in the end, Mary's immaculate heart will triumph. When all is said and done, we are on the winning side in all this, and don't ever doubt it. Hmm? I always say, I read the end of the book, and we win. Hmm? <laughs> right? Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but fear not, I have overcome the world. Now think about this, all right? Think about what we're up against. The enemies of the church, the enemies of Christ, have all the worldly power on their side, They've got the governments, they've got the money, they've got most of the news and entertainment media, they've got the celebrities, they've got the movies, they've got the television, they've got the internet, they control all the means of social communication, they've got the courts, they've got the public schools, they've got the universities, and with them, an army of Marxist professors. 
an army of militant atheism is sowing the seeds of doubt and corruption and confusion into the minds of our young people all over this country. That's what they're doing. They've got all that. What do we got? All we have got is God. Huh? And if God is for us, who can be against us? Hmm? St. Teresa of Avila used to say, God is a majority of one. There you have it. So much for the public opinion polls, huh? And our Lord said, without me, you can do nothing. He said, if you live in me and my words stay a part of you, you may ask what you will and it will be done for you. It'll be done. Hmm? Now, Pope St. John XXIII was one of the most Marian popes in the history of the church. He said this, the rosary is a summary of the gospel, a school in which to form ourselves in virtues. How sweet it is to see the rosary held in the hands of the innocent, the holy priests, the young and the elderly, held by countless pious souls as an emblem and a standard of hope for peace and hearts and among the entire human race. He said, the only hope for the world and for world peace is the message of Fatima and the Holy Rosary. Hmm? St. Louis de Montfort, great apostle of Marian devotion, used to say that the greatest saints would be those saints who were the most devoted to our Blessed Mother. He said this would become most apparent around the end of time. He used to say, devotion to Our Lady is a sign of predilection, which means someone is headed for heaven. But he would say that disdain, contempt for Our Lady and devotion to her is a sign of reprobation. In other words, it's a sign that one is headed in the wrong direction. Hmm? He also said this, when it comes to priests, the most sure way to recognize a priest of bad doctrine is to encounter one who has no use for our Blessed Mother, one who has disdain for Marian devotion. Now, I don't know what your experience has been, huh? but I can tell you what my experience has been with many of my fellow priests in recent years. This has always been perfectly clear to me. Hmm? Um, I've always found it to be the case with a priest. Where there is no devotion to Our Lady, where there is disdain for devotion to Our Lady, there is always, always a problem with that priest. Hmm? Invariably, I think you would find that to be true. Now, this is a true story. Uh, this is something that happened in the part of the country where I live some years ago. But uh, there was a newly ordained priest who had just come out of one of these uh, whacked out modernist seminaries. <laughs> and uh, he was in his first parish assignment and he was offering mass on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. And during his homily, he went into the pulpit with three props. A little statue of Our Lady, a rosary, and a trash can. Hmm? Yes. And during his homily, right, he denounced Marian devotion. He spoke against the rosary. He said that Marian devotion is basically for uh, old-fashioned Catholics who are pietistical and superstitious. And he told them all that... Uh, Vatican II actually did away with the rosary and Marian devotions, and he tells them all, let go all this Marian stuff, right? Then, for dramatic effect, he holds up the trash can and he slams the statue of Our Lady and the rosary down into it. Well, as you can imagine, people were outraged. So uh, they went to the pastor, many of them, and they made their complaints. And the pastor did uh, uh, nothing. 
And many people uh, contacted the bishop, made their complaints and their concerns known to him. And as you would expect, uh, as typically happens, the bishop did nothing, nothing. Hmm? Well, guess what? Less than one year later, that priest was arrested out in California on a morals charge. He was tried and convicted for sexual abuse. He spent two years in prison out there. Hmm? Uh, when I heard that, I have to tell you, I, I prayed for that man, but I was not surprised. Hmm? One time, a lady told me that she had asked one of her parish priests to bless her rosary, and this priest rolled his eyes, and he gave her a dirty look, and he looked down his nose at her rosary, and he said to her, oh, you still do that? All right, well, yes. All right. All right, and she took her rosary back, and she said, excuse me, Father, I've got to go and find a real priest to bless my rosary. <laughs> Now, we hear this kind of stuff all the time in our travels, and it's always astonishing to me because Mary is the mother of priests. Every priest, by virtue of his reception of the sacrament of holy orders, enters into a mystical marriage with the church, which is the bride of Christ. The church, which is, in a mystical sense, virgin, bride, and mother. Mary is the queen and mother of the church, she must also be the queen and mother of priests, all priests. Do you ever wonder why it was that Mary was there in the room with the apostles on that first Pentecost Sunday when the Holy Spirit came? It was no coincidence she was there. She had to be there. It was absolutely essential that she be there. Why? Because she is the spouse of the Holy Spirit. It was because the same Holy Spirit who came upon her at Nazareth and made her to be the mother of God was coming upon her, making her to be the mother of the church, the spiritual mother of us all. Her humility is the key. Now, in a certain sense, we can say that all of us are called to greatness in life. Hmm? We're called to be humble, but at the same time, we're called to be great. Great, that is, in the sight of heaven. Think of the life of our Blessed Mother, the most humble of all of God's creatures. Think of her words in the Gospel of St. Luke, her Magnificat. Mary said, My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me. Holy is his name. What did Mary do? Mary acknowledged the great things God had done for her. She didn't try to hide them. She didn't try to deny them. But she was always giving God the praise, always giving God the glory, always directing everything back to God. God made something great happen in Mary. The greatest event in the history of the world, the incarnation, took place within her virginal womb. Mary's virginal womb became... Uh, like in the bridal chamber where heaven and earth, divinity and humanity were joined together, wed in a mystical marriage. The Son of God became flesh of her flesh and blood of her blood. That is something God intends to be known and understood and honored. Mary's humility, her perfect obedience to God's will, her eternal yes to God, her fiat, Reverse the disobedience of Eve and set in motion the events that would make the Paschal mystery a reality. And she changed the world forever. That is something God intends to be known and understood and honored. Mary is the masterpiece of God's creation. She is the masterpiece of God's grace on earth. The masterpiece of God's glory in heaven. It is interesting to take note of the fact that the high point the crowning glory in all of God's creation is a woman. The great woman of Revelation. The woman clothed with the sun. 
with the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She wears that crown of 12 stars because she is truly the queen of heaven, the queen and mother of all Christians everywhere, higher than angels and men. And why does the Bible give us the moon as the symbol for Mary? Do you ever consider this? I'm sure that often you have seen uh, images of Our Lady in sacred artwork, paintings, statues, icons, and holy cards, and she is shown standing on top of a sphere, standing on top of a round object or maybe on top of a crescent like the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Those objects represent the moon. Why does the Bible in the book of Revelation give us the moon as this symbol for Mary? Well, it's simply because the moon is not the source of the light. You see, the moon gives no light of its own. The moon only reflects the light. The moon only reflects the light of the sun. That's exactly what Mary does. Mary is not the light, but Mary always reflects the light. She reflects the light of Jesus Christ, her divine son, the true light of the world. She is the Immaculate Conception. And not to get off subject here, but remember that there is nothing so hard to understand about the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. I can usually explain it so the most fundamental fundamentalist can get it. <laughs> if you just think of it like this, God determined it to become man. God chose a mother for himself. God created his own mother, did he not? If you could create your own mother, how would you make her? <laughs> uh, I know how I would make my mother. <laughs> all beautiful, all holy, all pure, all immaculate. That's exactly what God did. We honor Mary, the humble handmaid of the Lord, little in her own estimation, but incredibly great in the sight of Almighty God. Hmm? Remember, greatness is not what greatness is in the sight of the world. Hmm? We know all the things that the world holds in high esteem. Wealth, lots of money, success, status, power, pleasure, fame, physical beauty, athletic prowess, and all the like, right? Um, St. Francis of Assisi used to say, remember that what you are, what you truly are, is what you are in the sight of Almighty God, nothing more, nothing less. Hmm? You know what you are in the sight of Almighty God? Hmm? Uh, you know what greatness is in the sight of heaven? Greatness is holiness. Holiness is the alignment of the human will with the will of Almighty God, right? That's what makes a saint. That is how even the most little, simple, humble, hidden, unknown soul can be great in the sight of Almighty God. Why is the rosary so powerful? There are many reasons. Again, I believe it is simply because the rosary is the prayer of the humble. And you have to understand the importance of the virtue of humility. Humility, we say, is the root and foundation of all virtues without which no other virtue can grow very much in your life. St. John Vianney used to say that humility is the other virtues like the chain on the rosary. Hmm? And the other virtues are like the beads. Um, think of your rosary. If you pull out that chain, what's going to happen? All those beads are going to fall and they're going to scatter, right? That is to say, all the other virtues cannot long endure without the virtue of humility. Pope St. John XXIII um, prayed 15 decades of the rosary every single day. You know, with the weight of the world on his shoulders, as the Supreme Pontiff, he still made the time to pray 15 decades, one of the most Marian popes in, in history, as I said before. But every evening at 7.30, Pope St. John XXIII would gather together the entire papal household, the priests, the nuns, the secretaries, uh, the housekeepers who lived there, and they all prayed the glorious mysteries together. That was their family rosary. Mm. One time, 
A woman went to St. John the 23rd and she told him that she was thinking of giving up the rosary because when she tried to pray the rosary, she could never concentrate. She could never be recollected, focused. Um, her mind would wander, so she thought that her prayers were not efficacious at all, and uh, she asked uh, good Pope John what he thought of all this, and this was his response. He said, don't ever, ever give up the rosary. He said, the only bad rosary is the one that doesn't get said. Mm -hmm. Now, <laughs> now, we need to be clear about this. Mm -hmm. Our country, and in fact the whole world, is at a critical moment in history. We are living in a dangerous and uncertain world that becomes more so with every passing day. Uh, we see the rise of international terrorism, the rise of militant Islamic fundamentalism, the spread of nuclear weapons, now in the hands of the likes of North Korea and Pakistan. We see communism resurgent. We see a new and aggressive form of atheism spreading like wildfire on our college campuses all over this country, taking in more and more of our young people all the time. We see the spiritual confusion and the moral chaos as our pagan culture tries to shove the culture of death down our throats, along with a whole toxic alphabet soup of sexual sin and dysfunction, which gets longer by the day. Hmm? Friends, you know as well as I do, you should know, a spiritual and moral renewal in this country is going to take a miracle. It's going to take miracles, moral miracles, miracles of grace and repentance and conversion and evangelization, and there is no time to lose, my friends. As I mentioned to you, I spent the better part of the last 25 years on the road living out of my suitcase preaching the gospel, and I'm sorry to tell you that everywhere we go today, and I mean everywhere, we're seeing the terrible effects of the great loss of faith in our time. And it seems like every Catholic family has been wounded in some way in this great abandonment of faith in our day. It seems like every American family has been impacted and wounded in one way or another. For example, wounded by addiction in one form or another, wounded by drugs. Are you aware of the fact that in the last three years, more than 80,000 Americans, most of them young Americans, have died of opioid-related drug overdoses? That's a lot of sorrowful mothers in mourning, huh? A lot of families in mourning. We see the families wounded by substance abuse, by sexual abuse, wounded by pornography, poisoning souls and minds and marriages more with every passing day. We see the families wounded by infidelity, bad marriages, family breakup, and all the emotional and psychological devastation that goes with that. We see the families wounded by suicides, crime, violence, atheism, whatever. All of us have the good sense to realize we are living at the time of a tragic, disastrous, spiritual, and moral collapse. It is happening now because we as a people have turned away from God. God sends his Holy Mother, to call us back, and it's going to take miracles. But again, I say to you, it can be done, and it must be done, and it must begin with people like you, people like us. History has proven time and time again, God makes miracles through His Holy Mother and the Rosary. Remember, the Rosary is not just a devotion, not just a prayer, not just a meditation. The Rosary is a weapon, a weapon of protection and a weapon of victory, and all the facts of history will bear this out. Of course, today, the Feast of Our Lady of the Rosary, we celebrate the great victory, the naval battle of Lepanto, October the 7th, 1571. The Battle of Lepanto, which was, according to Wikipedia, the largest naval battle ever fought in the Western Hemisphere, involving more than 400 warships engaged. Mm -hmm. At Lepanto, the badly outnumbered Christian fleet defeated the Muslim invasion fleet, the Armada of the Ottoman Empire, after Pope St. Pius V led the Catholic countries of Europe in a huge rosary crusade. Now, interestingly, during that battle, as the Muslim fleet was moving toward the Christian fleet, 
The Muslim fleet was miraculously, mysteriously hit and turned. Many ships wrecked by what today we would call straight line winds, hurricane force winds that decimated the Muslim fleet but did not touch the Christians at all. Truly, it was a miracle. It is a miracle that must be attributed to the power of Our Lady in the Rosary. The Christian world was saved again from Muslim invasions at the Battle of Vienna, September the 11th, 1683. And again, at the Battle of Belgrade in 1716 with the Christian forces led by St. John of Capistrano. In the 20th century, we witnessed many examples of the victories of the Rosary, right? Uh, for example, uh, after World War II, Austria had been petitioned into four occupation zones. The eastern part of Austria was occupied by the Red Army. Mm -hmm. The Russians were in total control. They showed no signs of leaving. They were giving every indication that when their time came, when the chance would make itself known, they would take control of the whole country. Mm -hmm. In April of 1955, a Franciscan priest, Father Peter Pavlicek, organized a rosary crusade throughout Austria. In no time, he had gained a half a million members. Uh, in May of that same year, the Austrian chancellor was summoned to Moscow. He was received there on May the 13th. The Russians delivered him a very discouraging, very threatening message gave him every indication they were not leaving any time, right? To the surprise and shock and astonishment of the whole world, later in that month of May 1955, the Russians packed up and pulled out of Austria, never to return. Mm -hmm. In 1964, Brazil came under communist control, Brazil being the biggest country in South America, it was feared that all of Latin America would fall. Mm -hmm. Father Patrick Payton, the rosary priest, organized a huge uh, rosary crusade all over Brazil with five and a half million taking part. Less than a year later, the communist government in Brazil fell. Uh, April the 25th, 1974, communists came to power in Portugal, four teachers, launched a nationwide rosary crusade. Less than a year later, the communists fell in Portugal. Hmm? We should not be surprised by this. Hmm? I'm running out of time here. <laughs> God. Let me just say this to you. If you study church history, you will see that some of Christianity's most decisive battles, battles like Lepanto, Vienna, Malta, La Rochelle, were fought and won, not so much with a sword, not only with the blood and sacrifices of Christian soldiers and sailors, but especially with the Holy Rosary. Hmm? In his great letter on the Holy Rosary, Rosarium Virginis Mariae, Pope St. John Paul II said this, the church has always attributed special efficacy to this prayer in trusting to the rosary the most difficult problems at times when Christianity itself seemed under threat. Its deliverance was attributed to the power of this prayer and Our Lady of the Rosary was acclaimed as the one whose intercession brought salvation and victory. Why should we not once more have recourse to the rosary with the same faith as those who have gone before us? The rosary retains all its power. Therefore, I look to all of you, brothers and sisters of every state of life, to you, Christian families, to you, the sick and the elderly, and to you, young people, confidently take up the rosary once again. Today, I entrust to the power of this prayer, the cause of world peace, and the cause of the family." End quote. All this should make sense to you. The great theologian, St. Bonaventure, used to say, there is only one creature that Satan fears, she is Mary. Yes, there is only one human person the devil fears, and it is the woman, the great woman of the Bible, the great woman of faith, the woman clothed with the sun. Satan fears Mary. He fears her power. 
her dignity, her authority over her spiritual children. That is why where there is true love for Mary in a parish, where there is true devotion to the mother of God, there you will see a deeper love of Christ. There you will see people turning to Christ. There you will see miracles of repentance, zeal for the faith, faith in action. There you will see Eucharistic adoration, reverence at Mass, churches full, many people at daily Mass. There you will see conversions to the faith. There you will see many vocations to the priesthood and religious life. There you will see the Holy Spirit pouring out His greatest gifts. The fruits of her prayers and the proof of her power are always to be found in those parishes. In those parishes, you're going to find sinners converted, bad habits broken, temptations overcome, people set free from the bondage of sin, special graces given, greater love for Jesus Christ and His church and His gospel. That is what happens in a parish where there is true devotion to Mary and my brothers and sisters in Christ. This, I tell you, is the true spirit of Vatican II. Remember, no general council in the 2,000-year history of the church wrote as much in praise of our Blessed Mother as did the Second Vatican Council. So anyone who tries to tell you that Vatican II tried to diminish or do away with devotion to Our Lady in the Rosary is simply wrong. They need to get their facts straight. I'm out of time, folks. Let me leave you with one last quotation here. In one of the last interviews that she granted, this is what Sister Lucia said. Quote, Most Holy Virgin in these last times in which we live has given a new power to the recitation of the Holy Rosary to such an extent that there is no problem, no matter how difficult it is, in the personal life of each one of us or of our families or even of people or of nations that cannot be solved with the rosary. With the Holy Rosary, we will save ourselves. We will console our Lord and obtain the salvation of many souls. So we pray again today. O oh, Mary, conceive without sin. Pray for us who have recourse to thee. God bless you. Thank you.